Hello, and welcome back to the Maltic Global Conference. Um, I am going to remind you that if you have any types of chat messages, uh, please feel free in the upper right to use that little uh, chat icon and, the, um, and encourage you to also use the Q&A section right next to that with any kind of questions you may have. And at the end of the session, after Peter is done presenting, then we'll get a chance to get to those uh, Q&As um, along the way. So without further ado, I want to introduce Peter Harlander. Uh, for those who don't know Peter, Peter has been involved for over 20 years in uh, IT law and marketing law as well. And he's considered to be a uh, data protection uh, expert. And joining us from uh, Austria, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Peter. Uh, thanks for being here, Peter. Thank and I'll you. Let you get on with your uh, presentation whenever you're getting started, uh, ready to get started there. Yes, I will do. Thank you. So, welcome and good afternoon. Thank you for joining my session. Uh, please excuse my English. I don't have to do webinars in English quite frequently, but I can promise you the content is better than my English, so you have a reason to stay, definitely. Well, uh, the GDPR is uh, a growing concern in marketing. Uh, also because it's getting harder and harder to use tools that are based in the USA uh, for marketing because the European data protection authorities uh, yeah, judging really hard uh, and many people already fear that uh, marketing in this year could be like uh, given out printed flyers to people. Why is that concern growing? Uh, many people reduce it uh, to one single fact uh, because of the, uh, it, it's many people think that it's just because you aren't allowed to use cookies anymore. And uh, this is really wrong. And uh, because people believe in this, wrong fact uh, they start buying software that promises to be legal because it doesn't use cookies uh, or software that promises that it is legal just because it's on premise and collects the data on premise and gives it to google analytics afterwards uh, and what I want to show you is uh, all the reasons that you really need a consent for, because that's the worst impact on marketing. And uh, if you don't understand the reasons, uh, then you aren't able to choose your tools wisely, because then uh, you will you are endangered to fall into wrong uh, marketing uh, promises. There are five big reasons uh, that can result in an obligation to consent. Two of them aren't GDPR related, but uh, e-privacy related, and three of them are related uh, to the GDPR. I, when I check a tool if I need a consent or not, I always do it in that order because it's the most easy order. Uh, not because it's the most logical one uh, according to the GDPR and the e privacy. So let's start with it. If you are collecting data uh, for a newsletter, so email addresses and stuff, then uh, it's not a GDPR thing, but it's an e privacy thing. And here you have to have a consent almost all of the times if it's a newsletter for direct marketing. There is an exemption for actual clients. Uh, it's a little bit easier to send a newsletter to clients. Uh, but if you have a closer look at the exemption, uh, you will most likely see that it's totally worthless for your business and to have that you have to stick to consent. The exemption says 
that if you collect the data in the context of the sale of a product or a service, so most likely in the checkout of your web shop, then you are allowed to use it for direct marketing purposes for your own similar products or services. So you need to market similar products and the law is very strict here. So when I first seen this years ago, I thought, well, uh, if you sell a stove to somebody, you can sell him a microwave in the next newsletter. And here the law says, no, it can be only a product that can be exchanged for the other product. So if you sell a stove and collect the email address, you can send newsletter for the next stoves. And in most businesses, this doesn't help at all. This is cool in tourism if you sell a hotel room and the next hotel room and the next hotel room for the next vacation. Then this is really useful. Then you can make it easier. Uh, but in many other businesses, this doesn't work at all. And then you have to give the customer the clearly opportunity uh, to object. So in other words, you have to give him the op opportunity to opt out. So if we speak in terms of checkouts, you have to have a checkbox which is pre-checked and the customer can uncheck it. So this makes it worse instead of better because most customers won't realize uh, that they can opt out here because this exemption is really rarely used. So instead of consenting, they will opt out because they think that they will get the newsletter if the checkbox is checked because that's the usual way. So in short, if you collect the data for a newsletter, you will need a consent. The next category uh, is the special categories of the GDPR. The special categories contain data categories uh, of certain kind, like racial and ethnic origin, political opinions, religious and sexual stuff and things like that. If you are collecting these categories, you need a consent. The law knows other means uh, to make it legal, but none of the other means can be used in marketing. So if you need this for marketing, if you need uh, to collect the eyesight of a person because you are marketing classes, then you need the consent to use this data. So this is rather easy. Just check, do I use data of the special categories? If yes, you need a consent. If no, you don't need a consent for that. Then there is the third step. The third step is about the cookies, but not only about the cookies. When the e-privacy directive was launched, uh, it got uh, the nickname cookie directive. And this was really a bad thing because since then everybody thinks it's just about cookies. And that's totally wrong. Uh, and that's, uh, makes people make mistakes until today. So actually it is about all information that we store on the equipment of a user or that we gain access to on the equipment of a user. And there are only two ways to do that in a legal way. So, what are examples for this information that we store or gain access to? 
Well, it's the cookies. But also all data that we store in local storage or in session storage in Web SQL and also in browser fingerprinting and also the new Google interest groups are also an example for this because we get this information out of the browser, so of the equipment of the user. So these interest groups won't make it any better, even if Google promises that today. In fact, cookies are one of the most, yeah, uh, the, the cookies aren't the worst thing of all this because most users actually know how to de delete cookies. They can do this themselves. Uh, but in comparison, if you use browser fingerprinting, which actually is a method of collecting many data out of the uh, equipment of the user and to make a calculation to make the user unique, then uh, the user doesn't have any possibilities to prevent that. So actually the cookies is yeah like one of the best things that could be used. But if we store information on the equipment of the user or gain access to it, we have only two ways to do that in the legal way. The first one is consent. But in marketing, yeah, most people dislike that they have to get consent because it's a showstopper. Uh, it doesn't convert well. So if you need a consent uh, to start a marketing tool, you most likely know that if you do it correct, then you will like have 5% of the users that actually give you the consent. And if you don't do it correct, you will have more percentage, but actually you're breaking the law and the consent that you get is worth nothing. So people prefer the other way, but the other way is hard to achieve because the law says that you may uh, store information on the computer of a user or get it from the computer if this is strictly technically necessary to provide a service explicitly requested by the user. So this is a real high level that the law uh, states here, and it's almost impossible to reach this because of the words strictly and explicitly. So if you have a cookie to store the items in the checkout, then this is one of the few examples where the data protection authorities say, okay, that's a thing that the user wants because he puts something into the checkout pro process, so he wants to buy it. So we need this to do something he explicitly requested. There are a few other examples uh, like uh, for analytics, you can use a Matomo with or without cookies. It doesn't matter at all uh, to measure your website because the data protection authorities say, yes, the user wants a website that works well and there is no way to find bugs in a, in a decent manner no other way than to use an analytics software. And therefore, you can use an analytics software that is configured similar to an out-of-the-box Matomo with cookies without consent. But not Google Analytics, because Google Analytics has some other reasons why this isn't working for Google Analytics. So. In contrary to that was most people believe Google Analytics isn't illegal because of cookies. So, and in fact, 
I don't know a single marketing tool that isn't legal because it uses cookies. And on the other hand, I don't know a single marketing tool that gets legal if it wouldn't use cookies. Because in like all uh, cases that I know, and I know, know quite a lot of cases, uh, this isn't the breakpoint why you need a consent. And that is the fact that most people don't know. So the next step that you have to check, and this is also quite the showstopper, is the fact of the lawfulness concerning to the, uh, uh, yeah. So here you have to look at the scope of uh, the use of the data and you have to look how this use of the data interferes with the right with the rights of the user. And here, if you do uh, user tracking, profiling, maybe to create dynamic content, it can be that you need a consent. If you just do like a small uh, changes in the context to prioritize this or another thing, this isn't a problem. Uh, but if you uh, like completely hide content from one user and only present it to another user because he has a certain type of phone or a certain type of age or something like that, uh, then you would need the consent of the user. And you definitely need the consent of the user if you want to do retargeting and give uh, the information to third parties which track the user uh, in the internet uh, to show him ads. So actually, this part is the part where most tools uh, need a consent. This is also one part where Google Analytics or why Google Analytics needs a consent. Google Analytics isn't only used to measure and analyze our website, but it's also used for many, many other uh, means that Google wants to be done. And, and this isn't uh, GDPR. Uh, uh, th this isn't something that can be done out of legitimate interest of the data uh, processor, but uh, this needs consent. So here, this is a real showstopper in marketing. And then is like the worst showstopper today, the data transfer into third countries. So in countries which aren't in the European Union. Here, there are many po possible legal bases. Uh, the easiest uh, and like only one that is really working so far uh, is the basis of an adequacy decision. This is a decision that the European Union Commission uh, makes and says that a country has the same level of data protection like the European Union. There are only a few countries in the world uh, which uh, got this decision uh, and these countries it's easy to export data to it's like if it wouldn't be exported but be used in the European Union then there are a few other means uh, to export data which are heavily used uh, if data is exported to the USA but Actually, it looks like as if this would not work any longer. So there are the binding corporate rules, the standard data protection clauses, and the approved code of contact. So the approved code of contact is something that hardly exists. 
Most uh, US tools uh, use the standard data protection clauses uh, and they say, well, uh, this is what needs to be done to use our tools legally. There are a few uh, decisions uh, from the UN European Data Pro Protection Authorities, uh, mostly concerning Google Analytics, uh, and they all say, no, this doesn't work. This doesn't work uh, because uh, there aren't enforceable data subject rights and effective legal remedies for the data subjects. So, uh, there's no adequacy decision for the US. This, the other way doesn't work too. Then there is a third way, the consent. The consent uh, is possible, but it's also hard to achieve because you have to inform the user before he gives the consent about the risks of the export of the data to the USA and that there is a minor data protection level compared to the European Union. If you look at the average consent management tool, you will see that there is no word about the export of the data to the USA if they collect, for example, uh, the consent to use Google Analytics. So, uh, if a consent management tool says, we use cookies, please consent, you already know that you won't get a legal consent out of this. No way. Why? Because if you speak about Google Analytics, you would have to get the consent for the cookies, for the local storage that it also uses. You would have to get the consent uh, for uh, the way the data is used, that the, the data isn't only used for the website, but also reused by Google. And you would have to get the consent to export the data to the US. And this isn't achieved by the sentence, we use cookies. So uh, this is another point by the misunderstanding that everything is about cookies leads to severe uh, legal problems. And I would say that like, yeah, 90% of the websites at least uh, have a consent management tool uh, that didn't understand these facts so far. There are another possibilities uh, to export data, but you can forget about this if you are in marketing, uh, they don't work. So these are the countries with an adequacy decision. Uh, as you can see, they are few. And as you can also see, most of these countries aren't countries that are famous for tools in marketing. So yeah, uh, there's maybe Canada and Israel and Great Britain and Switzerland or New Zealand, uh, which made Matomo, but the other countries, uh, yes, uh, I'm sure you don't have a tool in your marketing set from the other countries. So this does help only in very few cases. If you use the standard contractual clauses, check if there are appropriate safeguards and if there are also enforceable data subject rights and effective legal remedies. Uh, if you want to export to the US, the answer is no, according to the data protection authorities. And if you start thinking about this, uh, you will say, well, if that doesn't work for the US, which other country will it work for? Most likely for no other countries. Uh, so as it looks now in 
the next few years, uh, the use of the standard contractual clauses, yeah, will grow lower and lower because uh, they don't work. The data protection authorities said in the last decision that it's not possible to do a risk based assessment. So you can't say, well, I send personal data to the US. But uh, even if the CIA or whoever gets this data, there is no use of this data. Uh, or if they get it, they can do really no harm with this data. Because uh, the data protection authorities say that risk-based assessment is widely used in the GDPR, but not when it comes to export data. There is no word of risk-based assessment. So uh, this rather useful tool uh, that we have used the last few years is going away at the moment. So yes, as I already said, if you export data to the USA, you will most likely need consent. Uh, and this is even worse in uh, other fields than marketing, because in marketing, you can at least ask the user if he gives you consent. But if your like, uh, office is hosted in the USA, you can't yeah, ask all your clients if it's OK that you uh, write him a letter in Microsoft Word uh, and that your Microsoft Word maybe exports the data to the US. So it's even harder in other fields. If you ask the user for a consent, then you have to prior inform him about these things. So uh, if you are processing special categories, you have to clearly state that. Uh, if you are setting cookies or other stuff, you have to inform about that. Uh, if uh, you export the data, you have to inform about this fact too. And last but not least, you have to inform him about the scope of the data processing and the encroachment on the right of the user so that he can make a well-informed decision if he likes it or not. If you really do this, then you most likely use most users uh, and won't get a consent from them. Because of this, some people are now starting to think if it's really the best idea to create the user on the website with a multiple choice test where he can check or uncheck what he wants. Uh, to be done concerning his data. Uh, but they start with a set that doesn't need a consent and maybe ask for the consent uh, in a better moment. So if the user comes for the first time to your website and you ask him, hey, do you want this, 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 this from me? He most likely will say no because he doesn't see any sense for him to give you his data because he doesn't even know if he likes the content of your website, if he does like your products or services. But if you check if the user wants to leave the website, that's the moment where many companies ask for a newsletter, you could ask for his consent for other stuff right at the moment at that moment. And you can do it in a way more a uh, beautiful way uh, you can make great design and ask him if you liked our website, should we stay, inform you and keep you up to date on Facebook and you ask for the consent for the Facebook pixel at this moment. And as he already knows, if he likes your products and services, he will be more likely uh, to consent at that moment. So maybe it's better to ask them when they leave. If you have a web shop, 
you have one goal, they should buy from you. So if you don't ask them when they enter your web shop, but ask them if they leave your web shop or even better if after they actually bought something, then it's the better moment. The website after the finish of the checkout of a web shop is in most cases the most ugly place of a website. It's thank you for shopping with us. Uh, we will send you an email as soon as we send you the stuff or something like that. Uh, why don't you use displays on your website? Make it more beautiful and ask the user and say, hey, great that you bought some products. Uh, should we keep you in, should we inform you on Facebook or somewhere else uh, when we have great deals where you can save money for your next shopping experience with us? Uh, that also would be a very good place to ask for content. And I've seen like no website doing this. So it's hard to get the content, but if you are in marketing, you have to ask yourself if you're doing it right. When you ask the user for a consent uh, right when he enters your website. Nobody in real life and offline life would uh, ask a user that is entering a shop, a real shop in a shopping center for the first time if he wants to subscribe for something. Everybody asks them when they leave or at the cashier. But you don't do this in online life. I don't know why. So this is uh, about when you have to ask the users for content. And the most important message is that it does not matter at all. If you have a tool that uses cookie, cookies can trigger consent, but all the tools that need consent would also need consent if they didn't use cookies. And if it's not relevant, if you use your tool on premise and collect the data on premise, or if you use a tool that is hosted in the cloud, as long as it is as it is hosted within the European Union or in a third country which has an adequacy decision. Otherwise, it does matter. So if you now going to use a new marketing tool, I have a checklist for you, what you need to check to be sure that you are doing it in a legal way. If you have a data protection officer in your company, you need to consult him. That's the first and most easy rule. Then check the lawfulness, check if you need a consent from the user or if you have another right to do it. Then there are possible activities. If you come to these, you know that you should stop because uh, if you do a data protection impact assessment and uh, it says that you should consult the data protection authorities prior to the use of this tool, you know that there is that this doesn't make sense because they will say no anyway. Uh, and that for good reason, if it's for marketing purposes, uh, because you have to consult them when there's a high risk for the rights of the user. And marketing reasons won't justify that. You need contracts with joint controllers, other processors, subcontractors, or and even with your employees that are responsible for the tools. You need to fill your record of processing activities. Uh, you need uh, to provide information for the users on your website, 
on your promotional materials if you uh, collect data there too uh, in your contracts uh, if you have a web shop uh, in a new tool in there uh, and you also have to give individual information to the users uh, if you collect the data without the user knowing about it you have to make sure that you collect the consent if you need it and you have to provide technical and organizational measures uh, before using the tool. So uh, if you use a new tool, use this checklist and make sure that you have green checks everywhere, uh, then you know that you are on the safe side. So this was my presentation on the GDBR and marketing. If you have any questions, you're more than welcome to ask them. Thank you, Peter. Uh, absolutely fascinating. I think that uh, uh, GDPR is one of those things that is uh, quite misunderstood and you really clarified a number of things for me. Um, let me get on with questions, if I may. Um, Ted had a question. Can you say more about the client exception? He said, I think you're saying more that you can send promotional emails without explicit opt-in consent for full clients, but does that not include prospective clients? Did he understand that correctly? Yes, that's perfect, correct. Uh, so it's only if they're really clients, uh, if they already bought something because you need to collect the data while selling uh, goods or services. Uh, and uh, you have, uh, it, it's okay if they only have the possibility to opt out they don't need a full opt-in. Uh, but as I said, uh, it's in most cases, if you give him the possibility uh, to opt out, uh, he will either, because you have a pre-check checkbox, uncheck it, or he will misunderstand it, with, which can also have uh, yeah, uh, impacts that you don't want. Uh, so. I want to discuss this uh, with the hotel because, as I said, in tourism, they always sell the same stuff. Uh, so the uh, similar products rule isn't a problem for them. Uh, but uh, if they guest checks in and there's an empty checkbox, which isn't an opt in. So yes, I want your sensational newsletter, but um, an opt out. No, I dislike your newsletter. Please don't send me one. Uh, the guest will most likely also misunderstand that because he doesn't read the newsletter sentence. He only sees newsletter, says, well, I don't like it. I sleep in the hotel today. I might get the newsletter for the rest of my life. Uh, and he doesn't check it. So he didn't opt out. You can send him a newsletter, but you will have an annoyed guest who says, well, uh, I explicitly didn't check it. I know by heart I didn't check it, but they spam me nevertheless. And uh, your guest will dislike this and maybe uh, give you one at one star rating uh, and say, don't sleep there. Uh, they will spam you no matter what. So actually this is quite dangerous in some aspects. Uh, on the one side and on the other side, it doesn't work for most uh, businesses anyway because of the similar products rule. All right, wonderful. Thank you for that detailed explanation here. I, I have a question. I'm I'm from Portland, Oregon, United States. So why is it so difficult to export data from the EU to the United States? Because uh, the in, in the authorities in the United States are, can uh, collect data uh, in some circumstances without informing uh, the data subjects uh, of the data collections and without providing them, them any means to uh, oppose against the data collection. Uh, and this is illegal 
due to the GDPR, uh, and therefore it is said that it's. This was also the that there have been two adequacy decisions so far: the safe harbor uh, and uh, the privacy shield, uh, and uh, the European Court uh, always judged that those. Uh, decisions are illegal and uh, cancelled them and uh, yeah at the moment there uh, they speak about the new agreement between the European Union and the US uh, which maybe will provide a workaround around this problem uh, but so far the talks aren't finished and uh, well uh, we don't know if this will happen or not. So as a, a organization that's based in the United States uh, and I'm selling into the European Union, uh, is there a subset of GDPR that I'm subject to? Uh, you are subject to the full GDPR. Full GDPR. Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, thank you very, very much for this presentation here. This is most excellent. Uh, I understand that on day two, you're also going to be doing this in German language presentation. Yes. So for people that are also watching this on YouTube, uh, there is a separate presentation that is done in the German language, and you're more than welcome to watch that one as well. So uh, thank you, Peter. I appreciate uh, all this information. Absolutely exceptional presentation here. And uh, I'm going to say goodbye at this point, and thank you again very much, and thank you to all the attendees who uh, joined us today. Thank you, David. Thank you to all the others. Uh, have a nice day and a great Mautic conference. Great. Cheers. See you.